through the eyes and the camera of Prince Banu Yukon of Thailand. A visit to India begins in New Delhi, the capital. The magnificent government buildings are symbols of a modern nation with serious responsibilities in today's world. But India is also an ancient land, and her yesterdays are dramatized in countless monuments. Not far from New Delhi stands the famous Qutub Minar. The tower is more than 240 feet high. It was built centuries ago as a pavilion for an emperor's daughter who wanted to catch glimpses of the waters of the Jumna River several miles to the east. Today the tower is surrounded by the ruins and the gardens of the palace. It is a favorite picnic spot for New Delhi people who find in its tranquility a nostalgia for the past. The romantic aspect of India's past is symbolized by the Taj Mahal in the old city of Agra, about four hours' drive south of Delhi. Agra contains many other tombs, mosques, and temples, which represent the full flowering of Indo-Islamic architecture. But the Taj Mahal is in a class by itself. It is a massive structure 210 feet high, and it is made of solid white marble. Nevertheless, its lines are so graceful, its symmetry is so perfect, that the building seems to float lightly in the air. This effect is increased by the use of a peculiar technique in the design motif. The size of the design patterns are increased progressively with the height. The result is a kind of optical illusion. Perspective is distorted so that the distant parts of the building are brought closer to the eye. Thus, the whole building is seen with equal clarity and instead of towering massively over the viewer, it seems affixed to the sky rather than to earth, a dazzling, shimmering bubble of stone, marble, semi-precious stones, almost overpoweringly beautiful. All this beauty was inspired by the love of Shah Jahan for his favorite consort, Mumtaz. Seventeen years were required for the construction of her tomb, but tragically, Shah Jahan was not permitted to see much of it after its completion. Shah Jahan's son, Aurangzeb, accused his father of over-extravagance in building this memorial to his mother. And with that excuse, seized the throne. Shah Jahan asked to be imprisoned near the tomb. From his cell, with the aid of a small mirror, he could catch glimpses of the building during the daylight hours. It is said that Shah Jahan was so fascinated with this monument that he gazed at it dreaming most of his waking hours as long as he lived. The Islamic architecture in India was preceded by the equally impressive art of the Hindus. Here are the group of temples called Kajurao. The effect of magnificence and awe is created by an unusual technique. The buildings are deliberately meant to be heavy and massive. On the outside, almost every square inch is devoted to intricate three-dimensional sculpture. The carvings represent the secular aspects of life, particularly its violence and passion. Inside the temple, however, the stonework is severely plain. The idea is that the material world is filled with frenzy, confusion, and disquiet, but the world of the spirit, in God's house, all is peace and tranquility. This effect is achieved dramatically at Kujarao, and the Hindu message of escape from the illusions and pointless motion of life is vividly communicated. The ancient city of Banaras is the center of Hindu culture. For more than 3,000 years, great scholars have come to this city to study near the quietly flowing sacred river, the Ganges. Life along the river is as unchanging as the river itself. Its water is said to cleanse the believer of all sin and to help him toward achieving moksha, release from the wheel of life. Banaras is a city of temples, many of them rich and famous,
roof of this temple is covered with 18 tons of pure gold. But Benares is also a city of thriving shops and busy people. The citizens of this metropolis live much as they did in the days of the god king Rama. Religion is a common denominator in the lives of these simple, kindly people. The Hindu religion touches almost every aspect of their daily existence. Here, a Brahmin priest leads a young, newly married couple from a wedding ceremony at a temple. The temples of Benares attract holy men as well as scholars from all over India. This man is a yogi. His aim is to achieve mastery over his mind and spirit by first learning to control completely the muscles of his body. Even when we stand on his hands, he can turn his body completely around. During the centuries that Benares has thrived by the Holy Ganga, the Hindu religion has grown wise and tolerant. From its basic philosophic truth, Lord Buddha received the inspiration that led to his enlightenment and the new religion he preached was eagerly accepted by the many people who were neighbors to but separated from the traditional Hindu culture. Beyond the source of the Ganges here, high in the Himalayas, the people of Tibet especially found that Buddhism satisfied the spiritual needs of their rugged life. They added richly to the Buddhist tradition and their god king, the Dalai Lama, became the head of the whole Mahayana sect of the religion. Today, because of the tragedy that has befallen the Holy Kingdom beyond the source of the Ganges, it is appropriate that the present Dalai Lama should find refuge in the land that gave birth to the religion he represents. No visit to India, therefore, would be complete without a pilgrimage to this remarkable young man. Prince Pandu was given the honor of a private interview with the Tibetan God King. He brought a gift and they exchanged the traditional scarf, which is a gesture of respect. Mm -hmm. Yes, it may be Shape is slightly mm -hmm. different. Yes, from it's uh, at the Pala art that went through Ceylon. Ceylon, so you may see it. Look at it. Thank you. I like your holiness. Prince Panu asked the Dalai Lama to unburden his heart in a statement to the people of the world. His holiness will be most pleased to say a few words. Thank you. Ah, Tindu. Some of the Tigala. She mean, I'm going to say, 
Man's progress in the field of science, His Holiness is saying, has enabled him to exploit nature for his welfare and happiness. Unfortunately, however, the great achievements of science are being used to develop weapons of destruction. Even worse, the strong are showing an urge to dominate and oppress the weak. Mankind, therefore, lives in a constant state of fear and distress. This suffering can be traced to man's egoism, which makes him think in terms of victory for myself, defeat for others. The only remedy for this error is a rededication to religion and a renewed practice of religious truth. Lord Buddha enjoined us to seek refuge in the three ratnas, the Buddha, his teachings and his disciples, the belief in and observance of the chain of cause and effect, and the casting out of sin in the attempt to achieve virtue. All of us must recognize that all living beings are our kinsmen, and we must work for their benefit. If mankind accepts these ideals, then world peace will inevitably follow. All men, regardless of nationality, crave peace and happiness. No one desires misery and suffering. Man can elevate the human race above the animal kingdom only if he desists from causing injury to the weak and only if he respects the rights of even the most helpless. Only by perceiving and practicing this truth shall we preserve the great achievements of the human race. I take this opportunity to thank the people of the world, Buddhist and non-Buddhist, who have given help and sympathy to my people and to myself in this time of our sorrow and disaster. I want to say nothing that might evoke ill feelings, but most of you know what has happened and is happening in Tibet. Your sympathy has given us, the Tibetan people and myself, great consolation, encouragement and hope in these days of our suffering. Prince Pano then mentioned that the Dalai Lama was assumed to be a living Buddha or God King and he asked the young man how this felt. The Dalai Lama said, what a remark, I am only a blessed follower of the Lord Buddha. At the same time, Prince Pano had asked if His Holiness sponsored resistance to the Chinese invaders simply in order to regain power and riches. The Dalai Lama replied, how could that be? If I desired only power and wealth, I could surely obtain them by forfeiting the right of my people to resist the Chinese invaders. From the time of my childhood, I have been taught only piousness. All Buddhists must know that our sanghas, our priests, are barred from indulging in worldly pleasure and must give up material possessions. <laughs> What are power and riches to me? I did not become Dalai Lama through the use of force and power. Why then should I try to gain them? I want and I possess only the teachings of our Lord Buddha. As the leader of the followers of his teachings, the welfare of my people and my country are my responsibility. The accusation that I wish power and riches is only evil talk on the part of my enemies, the Chinese.
These enemies have become wicked indeed. They have destroyed our homes. They have turned our guns on us. Our people live under great privation and suffering. Prince Banu asked next what His Holiness expected of the future. The Dalai Lama replied, as a leader of the Buddhist religion in Tibet, I hope that my suppressed people will win the sympathy and understanding and support of all those in the world who respect the rights and liberty of mankind. Please consider, he said, that there are only nine million Tibetans, probably less now. This is only a tiny majority compared to the populations of China, India, or America. Although our number is small, although we are only a few millions, what right has any people or nation to deny us basic human rights? Why cannot we have our liberty, our rights, our simple existence? In the present circumstances, I have only my hope. It is a small hope, but it is indestructible. I hope that we can persist against overpowering might until justice at last prevails. Finally, Prince Banu suggested to His Holiness that people of a small country must have tolerance and patience. <laughs> The Dalai Lama's words in reply are, Yes, I agree. We are the people of a small country. For many years before this last incident, we were tolerant and patient. But there is a limit to these virtues. When oppression become greater than human beings can bear, they must resist. Not all human beings have attained nirvana, nor have they reached the stage in which they can dis guard human emotions. Finally, the Dalai Lama issued his blessing. I take this opportunity to thank the people of the world, he said, non-Buddhist and Buddhist alike, who have given help and sympathy to my people and to myself in this time of our sorrow and despair. Your sympathy has given us great consolation, encouragement and hope in these dark days of our suffering. The use of a peculiar technique in the design motif. The size of the design patterns are increased progressively with the height the result is a kind of optical illusion. Perspective is distorted so that the distant parts of the building are brought closer to the eye. Thus the whole building is seen with equal clarity and instead of towering massively over the viewer, it seems affixed to the sky rather than to earth, a dazzling shimmering bubble of stone, marble, semi-precious stones, almost overpoweringly beautiful. All this beauty was inspired by the love of Shah Jahan for his favorite consort, Mumtaz. Seventeen years were required for the construction of her tomb, but tragically Shah... India, through the eyes and the camera of Prince Banu Yukon of Thailand. A visit to India begins in New Delhi, the capital, the magnificent government buildings are symbols of a modern nation with serious responsibilities in today's world.
But India is also an ancient land, and her yesterdays are dramatized in countless monuments. Not far from New Delhi stands the famous Qutub Minar. The tower is more than 240 feet high. It was built centuries ago as a pavilion for an emperor's daughter who wanted to catch glimpses of the waters of the Jumna River several miles to the east. Jahan was not permitted to see much of it after its completion. Shah Jahan's son, Aurangzeb, accused his father of over-extravagance in building this memorial to his mother. And with that excuse, seized the throne. Shah Jahan asked to be imprisoned near the tomb. From his cell, with the aid of a small mirror, he could catch glimpses of the building during the daylight hours. It is said that Shah Jahan was so fascinated with this monument that he gazed at it dreaming most of his waking hours as long as he lived. surrounded by the ruins and the gardens of the palace is a favorite picnic spot for New Delhi people who find in its tranquility a nostalgia for the past. The romantic aspect of India's past is symbolized by the Taj Mahal in the old city of Agra about four hours drive south of Delhi. Agra contains many other tombs, mosques and temples which represent the full flowering of Indo-Islamic architecture. But the Taj Mahal is in a class by itself. It is a massive structure 210 feet high and it is made of solid white marble. Nevertheless, its lines are so graceful, its symmetry is so perfect that the building seems to float lightly in the air. This effect is increased by...